All okay. right, folks, welcome back. Welcome back all. And thanks so much for joining us uh, throughout this um, uh, terrific set of conversations. Uh, and I am thrilled um, uh, to be welcoming um, Andy Slavitt, former acting administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, and my old colleague, Jean Sperling, former director of the National Economic Council under Presidents Obama and Clinton. Um, Andy, Jean, uh, thank you for being here. Welcome. And I'm uh, delighted that we're going to take a half hour to wrap up today's conversations um, and ask you about some of the most pressing economic uh, policy questions we're now facing. And I thought we could kick off um, uh, by um, just let me ask you generally. Um, uh, let's imagine that we find ourselves uh, with a new administration. And let me just start by asking Eugene and then Andy, I'll turn to you. What do you think needs to happen to get this economic crisis and the health crisis under control? Uh, Gene, what do you think needs to happen um, uh, to move us forward on that front? Well, listen, I, I think that if there's a new administration, which I hope, I think there's three very critical things that one has to think about that goes, I think, beyond just the critical relief efforts that obviously people are fighting on number right now. First of all, um, first of all, I think one has to look for where we can turn crisis responses into lasting structural reform. You know, there's the expression, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Well, if you have an important policy response, it is a terrible thing to let it stay as just a crisis response when it should be part of our long-term, what I like to think of as economic dignity net. So when you look at like the stimulus checks that went out, they were kind of good the first time because we have such big holes in our safety net that it helped go to the poorest children. It helped go to people with disabilities, et cetera. That was important. But our long-term goal should be filling those cracks and those holes. And the major policy that really, we've seen, we did see some progress. There was not enough progress, but there's been progress on paid sick leave. But where you really saw a major reform was in unemployment insurance. We have the worst unemployment insurance system. Tens of millions of people are not covered because they're not considered informal employment relationships. And then if you are, you basically got 35 to 55% of your wages. Yeah. The fact that we broadened it to pretty much everybody and that we were aiming for a hundred percent, we might have overachieved that, but a hundred percent of your paycheck is huge. If a person can get a hundred percent of their paycheck when they are, when the country's in, a, in an economic crisis, it, that single policy means they can pay their rent, they can pay their, their, their bills, they can have food on the table. So it is just critical that I think when we get to the next stage, we don't just say, well, what's the best kind of temporary band-aid, but what is the best things we've done here that we now need to make part of a you know Rooseveltian or strengthening of an economic dignity net. So I think those things, there's other things, there's making the child tax credit refundable for the poorest children, there's paid sick leave, obviously healthcare, but the unemployment insurance should really be seen as a major goal to make that part of our lasting system. Num number two, uh, when at this point, it's not gonna be good enough just to be relief oriented or just bringing jobs back you're gonna to have to focus on creating new jobs. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have, you will face the reality that we still have a very weak labor market, which means bad wages. It means less power and rights and respect for people, uh, for workers. You, uh, it's gonna be a weak labor market. There's going to be jobs that are lost forever. There's gonna be transition. So I think Biden has this exactly right in his Build Back Better plan. A major job mobilization needs to be part of this, not just for six months, but for three, four years. And doing it on the things we need to do anyways for our country, like a Made in America innovation plan, like a green infrastructure jobs plan, like elevating the care economy to want to the importance of how workers are treated and the rights they have and the pay they have, but also the care they provide others. This is exactly right. You don't want to just create jobs building pyramids in the mall. You want to create jobs doing what you need to do to make America better. And third and final, I'd say is we need to have a conventional, we need to have a consensus understanding that going big is the smart thing to do. I mean, Robert, we can come back and have great debates and we can talk about fiscal long-term issues and modern monetary theory and its 
great and it's interesting and it's provocative and we should all have that debate. But everyone from Stephanie Kelton to Ben Bernanke and certainly me would agree that over the next few years, it makes no sense to go smaller worried about a one-time increase in debt that is about speeding ourselves to full employment. You know, just to wonk out for one second, net interest costs for the government are lower in 2020, projected to be lower in 2028 than they were before COVID. 2030, it's projected to be lower than it was projected before. What I'm saying is you've added trillions of dollars, but you have such low real interest rates that you're getting all of that benefit of speeding economic recovery and the humanitarian benefit and the stimulus benefit. And it's not even increasing our long-term fiscal cost. And I think, you know, we can't say this enough. It is not just about getting back to full employment. It's about how fast you get back to full employment. We know that young people are scarred can be scarred for life. We know, and, and this is something I worked on, long-term unemployment. We know how, how much more painful long-term unemployment is the short-term unemployment. These things are right from a dignity and humanitarian basis. But even if you want to just be about what, you know, hard-headed fiscal issues, these are things that will speed recovery. They will get growth going. They will prevent the loss of these people's, not, not just prevent their pain, but the loss of their productive capacity. So we need to understand that whatever dispute, interesting debates there are about long-term fiscal theories, right now, we, you know, a new administration needs to be big and bold, and it needs to be a three or four year plan, and it needs to be relief, and it needs to be job mobilization. And that is, to me, I think the, 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 the whether you want to talk stimulus, whether you want to talk job creation, uh, whether you want to talk just what's best fiscal or for growth. And if certainly if you want to talk from a humanitarian or values or dignity perspective, I think you got to go structural. You have to have job mobilization and you got to go big. Thank you, Gina. Andy, welcome to you as well. I have the feeling you might have been um, adding a new book to your credibility bookcase. Well, let's, let's say you, um, let's say there's a new administration. Uh, what, is, what needs to happen? That's right, Andy. What needs to happen, do we think, to get this economic crisis and health care under control in a new administration? Well, look, I, I think the, uh, I'll just add a couple of complimentary thoughts. I think, you know, between, it's good that you have, um, uh, both Gene and I here, because between the two of us, you have one economic expert, so that'll help you a lot. Um, I'll take it a little bit from the from the health standpoint, and, I, and I'll go pick on something that uh, Vice President Biden said, which is how do you get out of this um, and really get the economy moving until you've given the public a feeling of safety, the sense that this pandemic is under control? Um, what drives the economy? Um, haircuts are great. Uh, I doubt we're going to build back a economy on a uh, one by one service economy uh, with bars and restaurants 20%, 25% open uh, in some seasons. Um, and, and bars are dangerous places. You know, we, we either are going to acknowledge that or we're gonna suffer the consequences. Dormitories are dangerous places. You know, we have to, we, we, um, we can accept those facts and, and manage them and there are ways to manage them or we can ignore them. Um, so I think the first thing that, that I'd say is that you know, an economy that doesn't have as its goal to get people buying cars again, signing leases again, um, taking trips again, traveling safely again. It's not an economy um, that's going to create the kind of jobs that we need. And it's going to create the kind of world we need. And so having a credible plan um, to lay it out, which tells the public, look, um, this is what's required of us as, uh, as people in this country. This is a little bit of sacrifice. This is a little bit of contribution. Uh, but there, here's the light at the end of the tunnel, and here's what will take us. Um, realistically, that in itself will go a long, long way. He's got a seven-point plan um, for making it safe to do the things that we all want to do again, attend schools, um, enter buildings, travel. Uh, and that requires testing. It requires isolation capabilities. It requires, as Gene said, the ability for people to not worry about missing a paycheck if they don't go out in the workforce. Or guess what? They're going to continue to go out and work and they're going to continue to go out um, and infect people. Um, you know, there, there is a, um, we, have to, we have to have an approach to understanding this pandemic to say that it will 
Uh, we will manage it. It will get better. We will have more tools. We will have more resources. But it's not like it goes away um, in a, with one silver bullet. And I know that we've lived through 40 promises of 40 different silver bullets over the last year. But the truth is, that's not how this works. The good news is that the rest of the world has shown us that this can be managed. The continent of Africa has, what, 1.3 billion people. They've had fewer than 30,000 deaths. Okay, this is not a particularly high-tech undertaking. This is a low-tech undertaking. This is a citizen supporting citizen undertaking. This is not breathing near one another in crowded places. That is not, a, if you, to people who have experiences with viruses like Hong Kong, um, they look at that and they say, that is a slow pitch. For places like the U.S. Um, that where, where we really feel like um, much has happened after 9-11, we feel like we're living in some new reality. We're not. We're living in the reality that the world lives in. Um, and these are basic, basic tools. And they're, they are overcomable um, with some element of compromise. So just laying out a plan, sticking to it, um, and selling the public on it is going to be the most important thing. I think his biggest challenge, um, and it's going to be anybody's biggest challenge who replaces the president is how to unify the country. And because, you know, a public health message that 50% of people listen to uh, will mean that the virus continues to spread. So uh, it's gonna be enormously important that he continues to do what he's trying to do, which is to put the, separate the politics from these public health messages and that he um, show enough uh, discrimination that he doesn't paint everybody with a broad brush for People who live in New York City, this pandemic is, uh, it, people remember the lives, people they've lost, they remember the sirens. But if you live in Nebraska, maybe what the pandemic means to you is a restaurant you opened 10 years ago that you had to close. And, and that's very real. And I think someone with Biden's compassion and someone with Biden's focus on, uh, on competence, and, and I think Gene's exactly right, it is economic dignity um, for, uh, for folks um, that is how we will get there. Oh, well, thanks for that. And I want to push you both um, to reflect, um, before we talk too much about what might be coming, to reflect a little bit on this administration and its economic policy approach. Um, um, I'd like to hear from, from both of you, but we'll start with you, Gene. Uh, what are they doing that's working? Um, give me at least one. And um, some things that are not working or things that might need to be fixed. Um, I mean, Really, the only thing that they've done is occasionally they uh, cave to Nancy Pelosi. Um, I, I mean that. I mean that. I mean, you, you look at the unemployment insurance, uh, you know, that was driven by, you know, Democrats, and, uh, Schumer, Ron Wyden, Pelosi, others, um, who really pushed hard for 100%, ended up being 600, which gave some people even more, which, you know, may not be what you would want in a 5% unemployment economy, but I think has been helpful in, 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 in this economy. Um, you know, so, I mean, it's very hard for me to, uh, to, you know, throw them, um, uh, you know, throw them a bone. Uh, uh, I would say, uh, 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 Jerome Powell has been for a Trump administration, a uh, you know pretty good nominee. So I'll say that they haven't done uh, as bad uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, so perhaps that's my one positive thing. Um, again, maybe not what a Democratic administration would call for, but but let me tell you. But let me give an example of something where they're just being so off and just so political. Is the state and local funding. Um, I think uh, the times that President Obama and <laughs> I, I think the unhappiest charts that Jason Furman and I ever showed President Obama was when we would say, here's what growth would have been if things had just been stable at state and local governments. Mm -hmm. Here's what growth would have been if you'd had the bump up at the state and local level that you'd had in past recoveries. I mean, the fact is that a lot of the growth was almost about 3% uh, when, when you took out the government side. The state and local contraction is terrible as I think people say politically in terms of the need to deal with COVID for first responders, for teachers, all of those things. But also 
it is a huge deal in, in the strength of the economy. So we have learned a lesson from the last recovery, which is that you cannot let state and local be a drag on overall economic growth. So now you have a moment where literally nobody can be blamed for not having saved up for a once in 102 year pandemic. And yet this administration is saying basically that it is their fault. They alone in all the world should have somehow saved up money for a 102 year pandemic. And this is just, you know, beyond the kind of vile nature of calling some states, you know, like non-American blue states, it is crazy economic policy. And so I think this is an area where, um, uh, uh, you know, where, I, you know, you see people fighting about that right now. And politically, it might seem a little harder, the state and local, you have to talk about FMAP and Medicaid, et cetera. But, but even if you are a Trump administration, where what you care fundamentally about is just GDP as opposed to economic dignity, even if that was your concern, which I don't think should be our North Star, you should be very, very focused on this. And you know, it's very hard to kind of see what they have done that has been effective, that has not you know, been dragged to the table with. And you know, I, I, I think, as Andy said, I think all of us said, I think every respectable economist that I know almost across the board said, this is fundamentally a health, public health issue, that you cannot have an economic solution that overcomes the fear that people will have of getting sick, of someone in their family being terribly sick or dying, and that you have to solve that first. So they've hurt at that fundamental level. Uh, there's been estimates, there's an estimate out at Brookings recently uh, by Harry Holzer, that had we just been an average performer, not number one, not America first, just average, we not only would have 100,000 less deaths, but we'd have 9 million uh, more jobs. So it is really the precondition to uh, uh, a smart economic policy. So I think the fact that Mnuchin back in, you know, March, April was willing to agree to some things is, you know, they were democratic victories, but those were the wisest things that, uh, that the administration's done for the country and probably, you know, for their own interest. And Andy, one thing the current administration has done that's working, one that we need to work on. So look, in, in South Korea, which had its first, its first um, case the same day we did, um, within two weeks, they procured enough masks for everybody in the country for $1.16. Um, they procured enough tests for everybody. They mailed them to people. They put them in post offices. They put them in drugstores. Um, the U.S. response, uh, so that, that, is, that is what you might call a strategy. Uh, that might be called quick action. The U.S. response um, was essentially to develop a black market in masks that were settling for 6 or $7 a mask, uh, while people who were our relatives, our friends, nurses, doctors, uh, were dying. I just wrote, I just wrote the memorial to a thousand lost healthcare workers for the Guardian, um, and the vast majority of them, the vast majority of them, complained that they didn't have um, a mask that they could use. Um, several of them had written to their partners that they had been picking them up off of the floor. Um, we, I would like to say that you know that there was a theory to this that Trump took a free market approach. Um, by not pulling the Defense Production Act earlier. But I don't think that's what it was. I think it was a laissez-faire approach. Uh, because if it was a free market approach, he would have said, I'm going to use the power of dollars to start stimulating investments in all of the things we need to respond to the pandemic. Um, he didn't do that. He sat back and was very reluctant. And you know, we know he pulled a few triggers. He got General Motors after a while to get on top of ventilators. But by the time General Motors had gotten ventilators, then we didn't need them anymore. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, whatever economic theory you have, um, you need to have a crisis economic theory too. And um, I don't think they, I don't believe they were operating by any economic theory. I think they would like to say that it was free market and business friendly. Um, I, I just got off a phone call with um, the, uh, folks in the HHS and in the White House and a bunch of labs and um, uh, people who were innovating and building technology. And they've all said that with more money in February, 
um, we would have more than enough of the things we needed by now. Uh, but but it did, but it, but uh, Gene's right. It came to come out of the Congress um, to get there. So you know what did what did Trump do well? And I know this is going to sound really snide, but um, billionaires have made over half a trillion dollars in new wealth since the pandemic started. A half a trillion dollars. So the market's been it's been phenomenal for some people. I mean, I know I know people who are cleaning up. I know I know people who are. I get I still get emails from people selling me masks for eight dollars a mask. Um, I still know um, companies that are um, that are making a lot of bank off of this pandemic. Look at United Healthcare United Health Group stock. Um, so it depends on what your objective is. Um, you know I think it has been a, a big opportunity for some, um, and that's uh, and, and, you know people. You know, he, he, Trump likes to talk about it as people's four hundred one k's. Um, maybe ask Gene of the five priorities a working class person has um, day in and day out economically, where does 401k fall? I'm sure it's on the list somewhere, but I doubt it's above being able to meet the basic needs of their family. Uh, I doubt that they're quite prospering uh, in the, the amount in their 401k to the extent that you know, people who have substantial amounts of money in the markets do. Um, thanks for that, Andy. And uh, Gene, I want to ask you about your book, Economic Dignity. Um, we kicked off this morning um, with a panel about the relationship between um, the American worker and corporations. And the panel conversation began with a very um, moving reflection on what a worker at Amazon or Walmart's going through right now um, and what they're grappling with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, um, when you sat down to write that book, you couldn't have imagined uh, what we're facing now, of course. Uh, but I, I, I'd like to you talk a little bit about the framework you lay out in economic dignity and how it's helped you think through the economic policy questions that the pandemic has presented. Well, it's absolutely true. I mean, you know, for me, I wrote that wrote the book because I figured I had enough gray hair and had been around enough that it was okay for me to step back and say that for even somebody like myself who's been in 20,000 NEC meetings, that there's a little bit of a problem when we who work in economic policy don't feel comfortable or empowered or take the time to actually ask, what is our ultimate end goal for raising well-being? And that it is important to ask that question, even if you can't always answer it in the precision of hard data uh, uh, or it re means revealing a certain values. And it's not to me in saying that we should have economic dignity as our ultimate end goal. It is not a call against rigor, of course, or the use of data. And I certainly support the efforts people like Heather Boucher and Joe Stiglitz are making to get better metrics that better measure how we are, are doing. But, but I do believe that, we, that, that even us serious folk policymakers can lose our way or take our eye off the ball if we don't have a clear North Star and we don't define what that is. And so I didn't want to just say, well, it's dignity. I wanted to define what economic dignity meant. That number one, that it means three things that you have to have together and that you have to keep your eye on that as you look at economic policy. Number one, is there capacity for people to care for family and loved ones and be there for them in life's most precious moments? Why should we not talk about that second part, whether you're actually not just can put food at the table, but be at the table, be at the bedtime story, be at the bedside of a loved one in their last days. These are what define us as human beings. This should be part of that first pillar. But secondly, uh, do we have an economy that allows people to continually pursue their perp a sense of purpose and meaning and potential? Uh, do they have first and second chances to do so? And third, can you work with respect free from, from abuse and domination? And I think that it's so important to see all three of those together because I think it's very easy, for example, to say, oh, look, jobs are up, wages are up just a tiny bit, things are okay. But remember, if you don't have that third leg, if you don't have that protection against abuse and domination, the, the whole house of cards, the, the, the whole pillar of dignities crumble. That's then you're just defining the, uh, the, the coal miners in, in West Virginia in the 20s and 30s. They're working, they're putting food on the table, uh, uh, but they can only do so 
by subjecting themselves to an abuse and domination that is uh, uh, that that flies in the face of economic dignity. And that's and and part of what the book says, and the reason I talk about the Aijin Poos and the and the fights on Amazon and and uh, uh, the battles for the fight for 15, et cetera, is precisely that those fights are still going on today. I mean, I wrote about the meat workers and the, the, the poultry workers. They have seven times the rate of carpal tunnel syndrome, two times the amount of serious injuries, and some have been forced to wear diapers because they don't, adult diapers, because there's not time for them to take a break. This is the kind of electronic whip, the kind of micro, efficiency that Matthew Desmond rightly says was designed during slavery. It's, it, it is a vision of, how, of, of efficiency that takes away the view that people are people with dignity, who get depressed, who need to call home, who cry, and yes, who have to, to, to go to the bathroom. And so I think it's really you know, critical. And, and you know, one point I'd make you know, for you know, even for all of us who've been through policy shops and the quote serious economist is, if you don't have a standard like this, we allow a lot of pain and a lot of people to become invisible. And a perfect example to me is, if you look from an economic dignity perspective, whether you're sexually harassed at work, it, tens of millions of people might feel they're sexually harassed or abused at work, or that you can't take time off to be with a sick child or a dying parent. You might think that, well, that's absolutely essential to a sense of the economy and economic dignity. But you know how it becomes an economic issue? When somebody proves that it affects labor force participation for women. Now that's important, but the idea that it doesn't qualify even as an economic issue until you can lodge it in a, a stat is, does show the kind of metrics over values. You know, again, I didn't know all of this was gonna be happening. But I, I certainly am glad that in my book, I highlighted what I think is the preview moment of this, which was Martin Luther King in 1968 at the Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike. Because at that time, um, you, you know, the George Floyd was uh, Echo Cole and Robert Walker. They were the two men in their 30s crushed by a truck that they knew was defective and their, and their families and children are left penniless. And when the protesters come out, they want wages, they want benefits, but the signs they hold up as Martin Luther King arrives are, I am a man. I am a man, a basic call for dignity. And King is known in that March 18th speech for saying all labor has dignity. That's what makes the line famous. But he said two other things that previewed uh, uh, our, our moment here. He said, someday our nation will come to realize that the sanitation worker is as essential to our public health as the physician, because they both have to do their job for us to be healthy. And then he says, secondly, what good is it to sit, to win the right to sit at the lunch counter if you can't afford to buy your family a meal? Well, that speaks to us because this has been our national teaching moment of something that all we should have, we should have known, which is that the people who are uh, uh, taking care of health, taking care of our families, providing food, uh, picking the food are as essential to our lives, and yet they are treated miserably, horribly. They are not. They may feel. They may still feel a sense of personal dignity, but we do not treat them with a sense of economic dignity. And that last line he says about what good is it to sit at the lunch table? Well, I get choked up like everybody else when I see people clapping for our first responders. But damn it, if you know, if they don't have paid sick leave if they're not getting 15 bucks an hour, if they don't have union rights and protections, then shame on us. We're just giving pats on the back and clapping and allowing somebody to sit at a table or have a job where they cannot raise their family with economic dignity. And so the, the crisis didn't change this. The crisis just shined a spotlight on the gaps of economic dignity that exist. And the question for us as a country is, as I said at the beginning, are we gonna respond not just with short-term responses and applause, but with the long-term reforms that really fill those economic dignity gaps. It's incredibly important. Thank you, Gene. And Andy, I, I wanna wrap up with a question. I'm gonna start with you and then, and then turn back to Gene in a moment. Both you and Gene have been in government at a time of crisis um, um, and tried to make very substantial change under some of the most um, 
challenging imaginable circumstances. In your case, um, during the time of the rollout and standing up of, of healthcare.gov, some of the most important developments um, for millions of Americans' healthcare. Um, and in Gene's case, um, during um, the financial crisis. Um, I wanna start with you, Andy. How do we make the kind of generational, ambitious, and crucially important change that Gene's talking about? How do we do this at a time of this kind of crisis um, in government? Can you tell us a little bit, share that, uh, your experience, um, having tried to do that before? Yeah, we can just say a couple couple things. First of all, just, just on, on Gene's book, if, if you haven't read it, um, I think it's the first place you'll see um, concepts of economics connected to people's lives. It's not, it's not fundamentally a book about economics. It's a, it's a book about um, the human existence and how all of the issues um, of how we think about our economy overlay that. And I think that's what's extraordinary about it, if, if you don't mind me to say, say, saying that. Um, the, uh, the thing that has, um, you, you know, you learn in these moments of crisis is you learn what you're made of. I mean, in some respects, like I look at 2020 and if I were a religious person, I'd say, okay, someone's testing us. This is our test. This is a test of our country. It's a test of how we feel about race relations and whether we're actually gonna do something about it. It's a test about how we feel about all the people we don't know that are dying, that we could be infecting and whether or not we're going to do something simple like wear a mask about it. Um, it's a test on, the, on, on how much we're willing to stand up to power and corruption. It's a, it's a test of how much we're gonna to succumb to the very easy trap of hating the other side and not listening to them. It's a, it's a trap on, on all of these levels. And, and I think, you know, as you go through a crisis, to tie it back to your question, um, the thing you have to ask yourself, I came in to lead the rescue of healthcare.gov, um, is you have to reflect on what is the single most important thing? Um, what is the single most important thing? And then you just do the best you can on everything else. You know, we answered that question, I think, at least in the crisis I worked on, um, by saying getting as many people in the country the healthcare they need is the single most important thing. And there will be a million other things people want you to do. Um, but if you remember what's at the top, you do a better job. And I think you know, in the case of the economic crisis, um, they had to make some tough decisions. Um, you know, they had to make, do some bailouts that I'm sure nobody felt good about. Uh, maybe they don't use the word bailouts, but, 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 the, but if the goal was financial stability for this country, um, it's easy to decide what to do. You know, here, I'm afraid that, that if, if you were to ask me what the single most important thing was to, the, to this administration, uh, it was avoiding responsibility. And if there was a choice between taking a, a step that would save people's lives, and this isn't theoretical, there are, there's just sort of, it's just too well documented at this point, or, or avoiding responsibility, um, I think we know which path that went down. That's fine, that's at the federal level. But if you said to me, fine, we have a new administration, is, are all the problems solved? I think the answer is no. I think we have had uh, a number of other failures that we've learned about ourselves. I think we've had a failure of compassion, a failure of imagination. I and mean, people say to me pretty regularly, someone will say to me, I don't know anybody who's died of COVID-19. And I'll say, yeah, the reason you don't is because you don't know the people who grow your food. You don't know the people who, who deliver your food to the warehouse. You don't know the people who pack um, the meat. You don't know the people in, in the grocery store. You may know them by first name, but you don't really know how they live. You don't know their parents. You don't know who they live with. And you probably don't know the people in jails or homeless shelters. And if you went into an ICU today, unlike in March, almost everybody in the ICU is black or brown. Almost everybody. And so there's a lot of us who, um, it, it, uh, human nature is that if I feel safer, um, I take it less seriously. If I personally feel under threat, I take it seriously. So younger people, uh, people more comfortable, people who are more privileged um, have more, re have less, if they feel they have less reason to worry, then it really is a call on what they're made of, what their compassion is, and if you're willing to sacrifice for someone you don't know. Andy Bashir, governor of Kentucky, said something uh, that, that's really stuck with me. He said, you know, um, we will, our, our, you think about it, generations ago, if I would have told my grandparents that I would have to wear a mask and I could save people's lives, but I had to wear a mask, she would have whipped me. When she came here to Ellis Island she lost seven brothers and sisters in the process. She, um, she lived through a 10-year depression. She lived through um, a six-year world war. 
but she didn't know what was going to come out on the other side of it. If I said to her, you know, I got to wear a mask for six weeks, but it's going to keep, she would, she would have absolutely beat me senseless. Um, we've lost this sort of sense of what it means um, to sacrifice uh, for people we don't know. Um, and we've got this sense that we have all these liberties, but we don't remember that those liberties cost people dearly. They cost people their lives, um, that those liberties come with a price. And I'm not saying there's a right, easy answer, but I'm saying that the conversation should be had and the conversation should be balanced where we should say, we have a responsibility to one another. Forget the regulations, forget whether it should be a mask mandate, but what, what in this country, um, where have we fallen down? Are we willing to have that hard and comfortable uh, conversation? Because if we're not, um, then let me just tell you, this is a starter bug. This is a starter bug. This is not the most infectious bug we'll ever see. This is not the most deadly bug we'll ever see. This is a bug that ought to train us that how we behave to one another, how we lead our country, how we learn and adapt, how much humility we have um, is, is something we've got to uh, understand. We're joining the rest of the world that's been living with these problems for a long time. We thought we were special. We thought we were different. Uh, we thought the government or the CDC or some technology or a vaccine could save us. But the truth is that doesn't always work. And I think our great opportunity um, is in this point in time to say, what is it that matters the most? And are we willing to be that kind of country? And that's the debate we need to have. Gene, um, I want to conclude. Thank you, Andy. I want to conclude um, today with just to ask you, I mean, you, you've laid out some incredibly important values, some incredibly ambitious ideas. Um, but you and I worked together in 2009 in the Obama Treasury, um, and we inherited a very difficult situation. And there are constraints on what you can do um, in the government in the middle of a crisis. Um, tell me what lessons you've drawn from trying to govern at a time like this. And is it possible to get from here to there, given that any new administration is almost certain to inherit all of the challenges we've just spent the last half hour describing? Well, you know, some of these are practical and some are more, uh, you know, just, you know, directional. On the practical side, um, I do think that one needs to look about using reconciliation in the broadest way. There's a lot of discussion about filibuster reform, but in a sense, reconciliation is already allows 50 votes. And I think that a lot of people look and say, oh, you know, geez, the Obama administration should have kind of gone bigger. Uh, uh, but, you know, th there are somehow that, that somehow people inside didn't think that. It wasn't that they didn't think that, it was that they were constrained by getting that 60th vote. Mm -hmm. I think this time around, one needs to really look hard at using reconciliation once or twice and understanding, you know, getting the large amount that you can get that will last for a three, four year recovery. Because yes, you don't know how the political environment is. The public can respond negatively as happened in 2010, where they feel like, well, you've already you know, done a lot. And so even though the right lesson is you need to do more, they start feeling you should do less or you should constrain. So I do think on a practical point of view, one should be looking at what one can do through reconciliation. One should be convincing people even who see themselves as fiscal hawks, that this is a situation where, uh, it, you know, again, it's not a particular range of the party that almost anybody who's looking realistically at the evidence understands this is a time to take on temporary, you know, debt to have a fast job mobilization that really stays at it for a few years and tries to speed towards uh, uh, economic recovery. And I, you know, I know that may be a fight, even if Democrats control the White House and the Senate, but I really hope that one can convince that that is a consensus, you know, that's a consensus view. And then, you know, uh, uh, you know I think the way Joe Biden has it, where you can, you, you can spend a lot for a few years to, stimulate the economy to get job mobilization. If you have long-term agenda items, you try to make sure that you're, you know, stabilizing going onward it is a sensible way now. And I realize, you know, people disagree with that and those are important discussions and they should be evidence-based. But I really think that focus on what can be done through reconciliation 
Uh, so you're not begging for a 60th vote, but for that 50th vote and realizing that you need to go large and put a lot in place at one time. The two, the degree we can get automatic stabilizers in, that, that is seen as somehow a progressive issue. Really, you need to convince moderates that that makes sense for them too. It means that you're spending money when you need it, when the economy needs it. It gives more confidence uh, out in the world that there'll be a degree of, of, uh, of strong demand. Um, I very much like Again, the idea in Biden's where he is using more of an assurance that the government itself is going to stimulate demand and things like, uh, you know, green energy infrastructure and, and uh, um, cars. You know, I've heard this, I talked to small manufacturers who've said to me, man, if I know that there's gonna be this commitment, we're gonna start retooling now. They weren't interested in whether they produce it now. If they know that demand is certain, it will spur innovation. It will spur large companies and supp U.S. supply chains working together. I think that that is, you know, so I think that is is the a very large argument that has to do with macroeconomic policy, but it also has to do with, as you say, dealing with the back and forth of, of how the politics may, might swing. So I think it's important to go big early, to use reconciliation and have both a relief and at least a three to four year jobs plan. And the last thing I just say is that, and it, it does maybe go to issues in, in, in my book, which you guys have both been very kind on, is you can't just look at averages. What's the average unemployment rate? I, I think it's been incredibly important to focus on the racial disparities in our economy that already existed, how much COVID has magnified them. Those are the type of, you know, you have to ask, how is everybody doing? What's the unemployment rate for everyone? How's everyone doing? Secondly, you have to have more policies in place from the start to ensure the deep, deep harm. As I always say, you lose your job for a few months, it's hard, you struggle, it's a bad time. You lose your job for two years, you lose your house, you often lose your health, you often lose your spouse. A lot of people never recover. We got, if you have an economic dignity compact, you do more to ensure that you people don't go through devastating cycles of eviction, of foreclosure, long-term unemployment. And so I think that has to be much more built in from the very beginning. And, and, and my last comment is that, and it does go to the kind of dignity compact, which is, you know, when you hear Trump talking on TV, he's trying to make it sound like, well, there's just this million different, you know, wild different programs that you're going to do and worry about it. But I really do think it does come down to something that unifies, not just the progressives, but I think unifies a lot of Americans, which is the idea that if you're somebody who does your part, who works hard, who carries your load, who cares for your loved ones, you're somebody who's, you know, contributing, you should be able to raise your family with a degree of dignity, to work with dignity, to retire with dignity. And all these different things we're talking about here are not a, 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 a list of a million different programs. The idea of paid sick leave or paid medical leave, the idea of being able to meet bills when you're unemployed, the idea of having the support to find another job, of having healthcare, these are really part of kind of a singular, very American goal. I believe that, 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 that you can find Teddy Roosevelt giving his beautiful quotes on as you can find AOC giving beautiful quotes on, which is that there is a, you know, this is about ensuring that people are doing their part in our country, live with a degree of economic dignity. And I think if we put that focus there, I think that you do have a chance to broaden that appeal. And if there's one thing maybe this crisis did is it hit everybody. It hit the small business owner. Nobody can say, oh, it's just because someone's not working hard enough. It hit everybody. People saw not having paid sick leave was a threat to them because people would come to work when they're sick. I hope that next president, our leaders, everyone can use that to say, this was a unifying moment that showed we're all in it together. It's not us or them. And that we're just not looking for special things for special people, but filling the gaps in a kind of basic American promise of economic dignity for, 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 for the Americans who every day are, uh, if I can quote Joe Biden, ordinary people doing extraordinary things.
Gene, Andy, thanks so much for, for sharing these thoughts with us today and for ending um, our conference on exactly the note uh, on, in which it was intended, which is to take these very real, very challenging problems and come up with constructive policy solutions for the future. Many thanks to both of you uh, for joining us. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. And um, as we conclude uh, today's program, I want to pause once again to, uh, to thank my colleague, Ed Rock, um, and, um, uh, and my co-director here at the Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance. Um, and we're joined now, um, uh, just to wrap up, uh, say a few words about the Institute and its work, um, our tremendous uh, board, uh, board chair, uh, the chairman of our board, David Katz, uh, from Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, whose um, extraordinary support made today's conversations possible. David? Thanks, Rob. On behalf of the board of NYU Law's uh, Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance, I first want to thank all the moderators and panelists for their contributions today to making today's economic policy conferences a real success. Each of you had other things you could have done today, but you chose to make your spend some time with us and, and really make uh, try to tackle some difficult issues that are very important to America moving forward successfully. I'd like to thank Ed Rock for uh, his contributions to make the Institute a success so, such that it can support programs like the Economic Policy Conference. Last but not least, I want to thank Rob Jackson for following my senior partner's lead and putting together a very timely, interesting, and provocative conference. And we can only hope that moving forward, we can put many of the topics discussed today into actions that make a difference. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of you, the participants today, because uh, you, you, you will make your own contributions by listening and, and hearing. And finally, we want to thank NYU and the NYU School of Law for all their support. Rob, back to you. David, thanks so much for your leadership and support at, um, here in developing the Institute and moving forward with these kinds of economic policy ideas. Folks, this is really for us just the beginning of uh, a long-term effort here uh, at NYU to um, have as much policy influence, to, have as, uh, to bring as much cutting edge thinking as we can um, to the transformative questions of our time. Um, and as uh, Jean and Andy just pointed out, um, it may be that we are at a moment where important generational transformational decisions are about to be made. And we're hoping to bring the expertise of the faculty here at NYU um, and the markets here in New York to those questions. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us uh, throughout the day. Um, uh, we hope you learned as much as we did from the conversations and we look forward to seeing you um, at our next program. Thanks again.